Thank you all very much for coming out early on a Saturday morning for this topic that is very close to my heart. I'm a radio professional and my entire career is based on the assumption that people listen. But as we know, not all listening is the same and very often this is not something that's happening right now with people talking at each other rather than with each other and listening. So we're delighted to have Arun Myra here, who is a listening professional. And as you can see in your brochure all about Arun, he's written several books, but his most recent one is Listening for Wellbeing, Conversations with People Not Like Us. I think this is a book we all need to be reading. And uh, Arun has been involved in many different organizations where he has really taken a look at how listening is or isn't happening. He was a chairman of the Board of Trustees of Help Age International and a member of the Planning Commission of India and a chairman of the Boston Consulting Group in India. So we're delighted to have you here. Thank you, Arun. Tell us the story of the, uh, an incident that happened with your grandchild that really triggered in you this idea that we're not actually listening as a society. Well, thank you very much. Uh, but may I just ask how many people here have grandchildren? <laughs> I feel quite at home here. They're, they're lovely. Yes, and the parents, and you have children but don't have grandchildren. Mm -hmm. yeah? and children can be annoying sometimes because you feel responsible for them. The grandchildren, you can just indulge yourself <laughs> and uh, listen to them. Well, my grandson, Virin, um, uh, he was five then. He lives in New York with my son, Sandeep, and he was visiting India. This is uh, many years ago, 2009, I think it was, uh, earlier when he was five. And we took him, I took him to show him India, Delhi. So we drove off into New Delhi uh, and I was sitting in the front driving, my son beside me, and Virin sitting in the back seat with his mother. And we stopped at many traffic lights, and there was crowds on the roads in India. As those of you who've been there know. Um, and in a while, this voice piped up at the back and said, Mom, you didn't answer the lady who was knocking on the window. And so she paused, and I also heard this, and. Uh, she asked him, which lady, Virin? So he said, at that light. Now, at the lights in India where you stop, there are a lot of beggars around, and uh, they want your attention. And we've got nice air-conditioned cars now. We're doing well that way in industry. Um, and so they have to knock hard to get your attention. And he said no one answered her, which was true. And then he went on and said, Mom, why do they have to do everything on the street? And so she said, do what? on the street wherein. He said, Mom, they are cooking on the street, they are eating on the street, they are sleeping on the street, and Mom, they are even doing poo-poo on the street. Why? So she said, wherein we live in a rich country in, in the United States, and we have a large house with many bathrooms and a kitchen and bedrooms, and so we are lucky. These poor people don't have any of that. So that was over. Two years after that, when he was seven, he was back in India again, and we were driving in the same place, same area, uh, and this time after these many lights, and we had forgotten, at least I had forgotten that old conversation uh, that he had had with his mother, and this time this voice at the back exploded. He said, what's the government doing? Counting daisies? <laughs> so that was an interesting expression. Uh, so my son turned around and said, what do you mean? So he said, look at these poor people there, even more poor people in India now. His recollection from two years before. And this was very poignant because I had just joined the planning commission and we were in a big public controversy because uh, we had put out that poverty in India was reducing and we had numbers, you know, people who earn below this and the large numbers who have crossed that poverty line and most people, the NGOs, were up in arms and saying, you don't understand what poverty is. Your measures are wrong. There are many more poor people than you think there are in this country. My son got a bit alarmed and says, shh, Dadaji, that's grandfather, is in government now. Now this <laughs> surprised this little fellow. He didn't know what government was. I mean, this person that he plays with and fools around with is government. So I explained to him when we went home what the planning commission was, I tried to, and I took him to the planning commission's offices 
very big and by a huge room with lots of staff around and saluting me when we came in, which he loved. And then he went back to the United States and good schools here where all the children were asked to write an essay on what they did that summer, what they learned that summer. And he wrote a book. He was seven. He wrote a book on the Planning Commission of India. It's about 14 pages or 15 pages in his handwriting with pictures that he drew for every page. And somewhere down the book, towards the end of the book, there's a picture of a big room with a man behind a big desk, probably me. And on the opposite side is a person shown like a stick figure, which a child draws. And what he writes there is, by this time, this is the 14th page or of the 16 or 17 pages, he says the planning community, he started with the planning commission, he says the planning community is a place where the poor people of India can come and someone will be there to listen to them and then they will not be poor anymore. And I began to feel that we are thinking of these people as numbers. We don't really anymore listen to them. We become so well off. We've got better cars than we used to have 20, 30 years before when there was no air conditioning. And the beggars used to put their hands into the cars and we had to touch them and hear their voices. So no longer so. So that made me really think about the quality of listening in society, my own listening, government's listening, and that provoked me to put together a lot of thoughts which have resulted in this book. This idea that listening, it's obviously an interpersonal connection, it's a one-on-one -on -one thing, but then that gets scaled up when we have government trying to, or supposedly trying to listen to the people that it governs. And yet it all starts with that skill. And I think a lot of people assume that if you have ears and you have good hearing, well, then you can listen. But this is an actual skill set that I know there is a lot of discussion and you have been involved in a lot of this. How can we teach actual listening skills so we can have those skills on an interpersonal level and maybe then that will trickle up and scale up and be broader, you know, more reflected in society? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we are teaching ourselves, teaching our children how to speak more effectively. We want them to be able to get on and to get their points of view across. So we teach them how to write well, write clearly, speak clearly, debate very well, put down another person's arguments and win the argument. This is what really we are teaching children in schools, I mean, competition and you've got to be prepared to be uh, one up in that competition. So speaking skills are taught expressing yourself clearly, using words, is taught. Listening is not taught. We have prizes in school for the best debater, the best essay. There's no prize in school for the best listener. The child who has listened to the world around and the other children and the people around, the best of all. The Holiness, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, who was gracious enough to write the foreword to my book, has been saying for many years, that we got to teach listening in schools to children. Now, some children or most children are instinctive listeners because they're curious. But then we teach them how to speak and they forget the art of the skill of, of listening. So we must have a movement to learn listening ourselves also. And we can't teach others to listen and expect them to want to do it well if we are not showing that we ourselves feel it's an important thing to do. So amongst ourselves also in conversations that we have, I began to observe uh, how I want to win the argument when I am in a discussion and certainly uh, talking amongst CEOs. I mean, the top dog is the one, who's, uh, the one who got his point across. And nowadays, of course, the person who can tweet all the time is a top dog. So where's the listening? So I uh, uh, have been uh, exploring with friends and colleagues and with Sanjoy here um, how we can reinsert the, the need for people at whatever they're doing, I said, whether it's in schools or in our, in our meetings, are we listening? That seems know? very much connected to the mindfulness movement that we're certainly seeing. Locally here, is, there's more of an awareness in schools. We're seeing it actually being taught in the SEL program, Social Emotional Learning, Mindfulness. I haven't heard of listening skills, though, per se. So what, what do we need to look out for? What are the skills that we should yes. be paying attention to? Well, I, we must listen at uh, um, T 
deeper levels than we do. We hear. We hear information, of course, we hear sounds. We hear information, words and information. And we must pay attention to that. The deeper level below that, where someone is giving us some information, uh, especially if we feel the information is stirring some objection in our mind, is to ask the question to the person, why do you think so? We never ask that. We are preparing a counter-argument to say, let me give you my facts. Your facts are wrong. So we get into this fact and counter-fact, and now, of course, we call them alternative facts uh, situation. And most of it is that. It's just throwing numbers and, and arguments at each other. But no one's exploring, asking the other person, why do you think that? What is the reasoning which leads you to think that that's the important fact that should be brought into this discussion? There's a deeper level than that also, is when you are starting to explore why the other person thinks like that, you might be uncovering very well something about the upbringing of that person, the culture of that person, which would make that person more likely to think that way versus your way of thinking. And that may make you curious about yourself. Why is it I think differently? What is it about my makeup, my development that has brought me to think differently to this other person? And so in this third level, one is exploring the who. Who is this human being? So we have what is being said, why is it being said, and who is saying it? So in teaching people how to listen, as I said, we do teach people a lot about how to pay more attention to facts and, and you know, get them all sorted out. We do teach, because uh, that's the whole art of winning a debate and argument about reasoning and logic. But in that, we are not quite often encouraging people to ask for another person's logic. Is using your own logic to then counter the, the other person's arguments. And certainly, I think we have very little listening to who are you? What makes you think the way you do? And this is uh, uh, something that I learned uh, very well in a, my opening story in the book, if I might. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, I was uh, uh, you know, at a young age, uh, in a senior position in a large organization in India, the Tata organization. And we were putting up uh, an Indian factory to produce Indian trucks, and the first of its kind in the developing world altogether. This is in the 19... Uh, 60s and uh, 1970s, and it was very tough because things don't work in India. If you've been there now, even now you find they don't work so easily, and then it was much harder. So to put up a modern factory which could compete with the Daimler-Benz factory of Germany or the Toyota factory in Japan in India at that time was impossible. It was very easy to blame the system, and we can't do it because look at the world around us. But you had to say, no, we are going to figure out what we can do to make it happen. So many things must work together to make this factory come about and for it to work. And so something has got to break down now, something will break down uh, the next day. And so we would start blaming each other because it was not done to blame the system around us. We had to find our own actions uh, that would uh, make this factory happen. So in that, there was a, at that time a, a person in charge of the foundry, which was the most difficult job. And he was constantly being berated that he was letting down the country, he was letting down the factory and the, because he wasn't getting his job done. And I was responsible for human resources, the human side of the enterprise. And I was out of my depth completely how to handle this uh, conflict amongst very senior people. So I uh, invited Father Joe Curry. He was an American Jesuit priest from Chicago. He had done some work in non-directive counseling Rogers, Carl Rogers, uh, to talk to us or be with us as senior managers. And in the meeting that he set up for us, he just started by sharing some anecdotes and stories with us. This foundry manager who was there was getting very irritated because I had persuaded him to come and he wanted to be back at work solving the problem that he was being blamed for rather than being listening to a talk and participating a whole day in listening to others and, and he didn't know what was going to happen. Father Joe Curry became the, the object of his anger very quickly in the meeting, saying, you know, you Americans, what do you know about India? You as a Jesuit priest, what would you know about a factory? I think we're wasting our time here. I think the sooner we shut down this meeting and all go back to work, we'll start building the factory again. Joe Curry didn't say anything. He was just beginning to look him calmly in the eye. 
man was sitting there and we were in the semicircle and he was here. And this man continued. And we didn't realize, but Joe was very gently, quietly coming closer to him. The look on the face of this man and Joe, we could see at that level, that he was angry and Joe was blue eyes and very calm. And soon they were almost face to face. And this man stopped for a moment. And he said, he said, Father Curry, you're the first person who's really listened to me. And that was the change. And that's all. And Joe got on and carried on the program and this person participated very calmly. But I was so curious. I mean, what happened here? Something, nothing happened actually. But the meeting changed. Listening had happened. Someone had heard someone very deeply, another person knew it. And so there was a trust there which helped us along. So that's how I start by saying that um, um, there is a value in uh, listening to someone else. And coming back to the value to oneself, that if I listen to someone else and I'm hearing my own mind, as Joe Curry then told us by the end, because we asked him, he said, can you tell us what was going on in your mind? He said, you know, I felt unfairly blamed. I mean, you invited me. <laughs> yes, you know I'm a Jesuit priest and I'm an American, but why, you know, get on so angry at me? And he was using not very good language even, you know, arrogant Americans and, you know, so on. But he didn't say anything, you know, he just went on. So he said, in me, all this was going on. And once more, it was strengthening in me my ability to handle myself. So he said, I thank him for giving me one more opportunity to exercise my ability to handle myself. It seems when you have that opportunity to have a face-to-face -face interaction, that that presents a, a, a different opportunity to really listen to somebody. But so much of our communication these days is on a digital platform. It's on Facebook, it's on some type of social media. And I think many people would argue that that has really had a detrimental impact on how we communicate. And, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but I would like you to read the, uh, it's a, part of the introduction, I suppose, to the book, because you really do touch on this as uh, why we need to put down our smartphones and get off Facebook and, and listen. Oh, so if you. I could get you to read that. Thank you. Yeah, this is on the opening page before I start the book. It is time to press the pause button, put our smartphones on silent, shut out the tweets, trolls, and sound bites, and stop the windmills in our minds. It is time to listen, to listen to the whispers in the trees, and the caring in our hearts, and most of all, to the voices of people not like us. Then we will learn and find solutions for living together on our shared earth. Thank you. Well, we'll talk about the listening to people not like us, because I think that's such a fundamental issue right here in the US, and of course, you've had your own experience in India. But this idea of how social media has so fundamentally changed how we communicate, giving us a broader reach, so maybe bigger quantity in terms of how many people can listen to us, but the quality of that listening or not listening or that communication has really been degraded, I think. You're going to get me taking off now. <laughs> Is it? You know, I uh, got in mind a, a, a framework which I'm going to share with you here, sketch it out like this. Uh, let's say uh, there's a need for depth in our listening, in our conversations, in this axis here. And I've sort of been describing how Joe Curry and talking about listening to the why and then the listening to the who. A richness in the conversation. But that's one-on-one, -on -one, you know, it's, it's uh, possible possibly to look each other in the eye and to get deeper and deeper. But we need to be reaching out to many, many people and social media, the internet and social media has given us that possibility. So there's been this promise of the internet and the social media that now you can talk to anyone anywhere and you can be on all the time and people can be reaching you all the time. It is so. But the result of that is be that while we're getting more reach, this is you know, the number of people who can be in the conversation, because the richness in each of them, conversation has become into millions, into zillions. Um, the richness of the conversations there is zero, actually. What is, seems to be like a tension that the further you reach out, the shallower becomes the conversation. It's shorter and, and shallower. And that's bad enough, but because we have an inability, it's inherently uh, the inability of the mind, the capacity, to be able to take in too many things at one time, uh, we have to choose the many out of the very many 
that we are going to pay attention to. So we then focus on those things that we can more easily accept and digest. And so we stay with things that we know or people we like. Social media is smart enough. They know that they can sell better if they give us more of what we already instinctively want. So that's how they sell stuff to us also. The sort of thing that we've been buying, they'll suggest more versions of it for us to buy. And similarly, the opinions of people that we have been tracking, more will be given to us. So we get communities uh, which are isolated from each other. These are gated communities, virtual gated communities, which are isolated from each other, don't hear each other at all. They're hearing each other, I mean inside, they're hearing everybody. So there's a resonance chamber amongst themselves, there's Fox News and this MSNBC, for example. And on social media, is much worse, because you've got to be much more selective considering the numbers that you have. So while we're getting the reach in social media, we are losing the richness uh, completely. Hmm? We do need to have more reach, and we must have more richness. So we have to craft processes now for democratic deliberation which have richness in them, which have large numbers of people in them, and richness in them, so that we can live more democratically and more harmoniously than we are presently. And present divisions are being aggravated by technology, which otherwise one would say, I mean, what's wrong with technology? It's the structure of the technology and the structure of our minds. When they're interacting, they're causing this problem. And of course, given I said, I'm taking up what shut me up, about the effect it's having on the quality of empathy amongst the young people, there are studies done here in the United States that within 10 years, the level of empathy that college level students are showing towards each other, this is psychologists measuring it, have gone down 40% among students. There are statistics undertaken by research by Pew uh, last year, a year before last, that uh, the younger generation today, uh, only 19% of them trust others. Whereas the generation before, it was 35% trusted others. And in the baby boomers, almost 50% trusted others. So the level of trust in society is going down. And they've correlated this to the nature of interactions that uh, the young people have. And even young people, I mean, they may have many things, connections on, on Facebook, but when they're out meeting with each other, you notice it. They're all looking into their cell phones, which is why I start there and saying, put it off. Just look the other person in the eye, have a real deep conversation. And, and that ability to have those deep conversations and, and to have that kind of empathy, I mean, that very much is connected to the fact that more people or less people are reading books, I think. More people are consuming some type of media on a digital platform in shorter bites not necessarily tweets, but shorter articles. I've noticed even now, if you get uh, news articles on a Facebook feed or Twitter, it'll say two minute read, three minute read. And they seem to be getting shorter and shorter because potentially our attention spans are shorter and shorter. That also is impacting the, the brain and its capacity for different types of thought as well. Absolutely. Uh, the brain has, broadly speaking, these two parts. This is you know, thinking fast and thinking slow. Daniel Kahneman, the thinking fast part is a part which instinctively responds to information. This helps the fight and flee abilities in, in, in living things and, and human beings. You know, must decide quickly, should I flee or should I instantly fight and prevent danger? So this front part is the one that is exercised a lot more with social media. You get you know, instant things and you must respond instantly and quickly and the new instant thing comes, another thing. It's, um, the part at the back is the one which would take something from the front, obviously, and say, I'm wondering what it is, and just leave it at the back and let it ruminate and check it out with other things. The thinking slow part, the reflective uh, part in the mind. Um, again, one more. Uh, studies done here, again, in the United States. So measuring the sizes of babies' brains, the shapes of babies' brains, in the United States. In the last 10 years alone, uh, they are finding that uh, the brain's size is some percentage difference, that the proportion of the thinking fast part to the thinking slow part has changed. There's a larger thinking fast part in babies' brains now than there was just a, a 10 to 15 years ago. So the plasticity of the brain, naturally, like any muscle, it adjusts itself to, to what is being used. And you're passing it on in our genes also now. That's what these studies are confirming. So it's very worrying. So coming to a book as contrasted to a tweet, 
Well, in a book, in a tweet, you look at it and you dismiss it and you respond with a tweet, back again at ping pong and go. With a book, you've got to stay with uh, somebody, somebody's argument and going on. And you put it aside and pick it up again. You're with it for a long time. A serious book might take you days or weeks to, to read even. So it's been again measured that those people who read more books have better reflective capacities uh, and so this is for the Jaipur Literary Festival and everybody. Encourage people to read books and not to just look at tweets and little blogs on, on, on Facebook. Hmm? And it would seem that those reflective capacities are what you need for ac actual listening as opposed to having a knee-jerk reaction. I listen to myself much more when I'm reading a book. I can't listen to myself when I'm hearing a tweet. Because, you know, then it is just what the person said, like the numbers, the the insult, and I think of a better insult and put it back. I'm not listening to myself uh, anymore with the book I do. <laughs> is there capacity for change, though, on those digital platforms, given that there is a huge capacity for reach and that we can connect with somebody on the other side of the world that we never would have that opportunity to on a one-on-one -on -one basis? Because I know Facebook now are discussing grouping people into smaller communities and to, to expand that. I'm always quite cynical when I hear Facebook coming up with new ideas, but is there a capacity to change some of those digital platforms to enhance listening and to improve our communication? Uh, yes, there is, uh, uh, but before I go, I'm just um, intrigued, you know, we started uh, this festival here yesterday. It was mentioned by Sanjoy that, uh, and you know, someone else said that, you know, there are half a million people that come to the Jaipur Literary Festival, and I go there, it's really a buzz, it's a lovely buzz. And here's a contrast, as he said, you'll have a few hundred people. So we talk again about the richness and the reach. So yes, we all have obligations to whatever platforms we are creating, whether digital or non-digital, to keep ensuring that we don't lose the richness in the conversations while we are expanding the reach. Now in social media, not social media so much, they're journalists and uh, people in the publishing world who are, um, have developed uh, smaller platforms in which uh, you get long articles, and it's like books, yes? But there is some choice, and it's like a book club. And so th that I find very beneficial, because you do, uh, are able to, you know, get the book quickly, immediately, if it intrigues you, and then read the whole book. Or it's a long essay. And so these platforms, these uh, are, I think, the via media between, you know, more reach uh, at, without losing the richness of a book. Another aspect of social media is that it's further entrenching us in our silos because we subscribe to certain news feeds, we're friends with people we potentially just agree with and it's easy to block out any messaging that challenges us. And so this issue of how do we listen to people who are different from us, who maybe have different opinions from us, I mean you have a whole chapter on this particular topic. Many people would say we're at a crisis situation right now in the US with that, the, the capacity or the lack of capacity to connect in any way with people who are different from us. And so your thoughts on that, how, yes, how do we yeah. need to do that? I think that's the key, that's the key, staying with the US. The constitution of the US has been very well devised and still stands after so many years. And we keep coming back to it and referring to, let's preserve the structures of our, of our constitution. But having, having a great constitution and good structures, we are so disappointed with the quality of the democracy in our own country. So I say this, you have hardware and you have software. The Constitution provides structures, that's the hardware of the democracy. The conversations are the software. And what has happened is the, the software has got bugs in it, it's got deteriorated, and the social media has contributed a lot to it. We've got to fix that software. So that's one thing we've said already. The other is this, that I would think of three levels in the governance of a society. Let me put the one at the bottom, which I would say is the level of the people, which has openness and reach. And the media usually is supposed to be there. It has freedom of speech and freedoms of opinions and dissemination of people's views, and social media is helping that. So it opens up issues, it opens up contentions. And of course, right now with the social media structures, because of the scale of it, it's creating these communities of people who listen to themselves, and to, and to no one else. But so that's the structure at the bottom. At the top, we do want some way for all of us to come to some agreement so that society can be well governed. So we give people 
make him a president or get a congress to decide based on inputs from us what is best for all of us. There's so much noise being generated in this public sphere that those people up there are completely confused. They're completely confused. And unfortunately, because they are elected by particular constituencies, they have to, in everything they do or say, show that they are loyal to their constituency, the votes they give and the things they give. So they're also divided very hard. I mean, watching the confirmation hearing for the, Chief, for the Justice of the Supreme Court, it's so sad to see. I mean, those people are supposed to be listening to each other on our behalf. Or they are not. They're just trying to put each other down and win some points in process and procedure here. So there's a missing middle. The middle is the part where things are not as open as they are in the public space, and they're not as tightly closed where you're supposed to be deciding which is in the top space. This is a space where deliberation must happen, dialogue and systematic deliberation amongst people with different points of view. So we must set up many more processes at the middle level where people who have different points of view are brought together to, in a good way, with good software, and software I don't mean the technology software, but the software conducting a discussion, having an ability, uh, getting the possibility of listening to other people's real points of view. Why do they think like that? So deliberative democracy rather than representative democracy, rather we need both. Uh, we've got so far two strong principles of representation and loyalty to representation and uh, lateral links. The deliberative processes are too weak to sustain democracy. So it's in the middle where we must say, okay, we're going to have a meeting and we're going to insist that the people that we don't like are going to be in the meeting. And this is not happening. This is not happening. We say, you know, why have them there? They'll just cause trouble there. Let them go have their own meeting. No, we must talk together. We must listen to each other. So the setting up of more platforms where there are people who don't like each other when they start off, but will listen to each other is necessary. Certainly in the television in India, this does not happen. We do get people who represent other points of view, but they're made to shout at each other because that is more entertaining and gets more TRPs and more advertising that and so on. That happens here too. Oh, is it? Okay. <laughs> and even this idea of having legisl legislators and elected officials listen to their constituents because I, there's a palpable uh, frustration and it's been around for years that people don't feel heard by their legislators outside of at the ballot box. You might have a town hall meeting. If you are chosen to have a question asked, you might get 30 seconds or 60 seconds at a microphone. People are looking for ways to have their voices heard. I mean, what are ways that we could implement that, even at a local level, either at city council, county commissioners? People, I think, tend to feel frustrated that they're not really listened to either. But I, I have a feeling that um, we could learn something from Boulder, actually, because I have a sense that there's a a sense of community here, a sense of pride in community here, which um, I don't feel in many other places. But it's good that people who are already doing well want to do even better. You're asking, you know, we could do even better at this. So this is a problem all over the world, that we must have uh, elections and uh, people who are uh, put in charge by us. At the same time, we want our freedoms to continue to do our own thing as well as advise them on what they should be doing and not be controlled by authority thereafter, and certainly India is in that, in that situation. So in India, just experimenting with, uh, since I'm the planning commission and my grandson had pointed out that we are not listening to the people, I said, well, I've just started this planning commission and the first thing we must do is really listen to what the people of India uh, care about and what their suggestions are or what would make the country a, a great country. So, but how do you listen to one billion people? Hmm. And you've got a short time because you've got, it's five years you have, you must make a plan in the first year and do something in the next four years so you don't have infinite time. It's not like the Oxford Dictionary we heard about yesterday. I don't know when it'll finish. You have to finish this in some time. So we said, okay, let's construct a process by which we we'll invite uh, people to share with us their perspectives. So let's start by saying, what are the communities in the country? There are people who represent the Dalits, that's the lower caste people, and their points of view must be heard and included. There are women and their issues, there are children and their issues, and, and so on. You can find many communities who feel that they have not been heard and included sufficiently, so we must hear them at the very least. Hmm? We must also hear, yes, sure, business people, because they're part of the economy, so what are their views? 
and so on. So then we came down to you know, a set of about 30 uh, communities or constituencies we must hear from. Now you're devising a billion people into these constituencies, how shall you hear? So we said, well, let's ask for the people who say, the associations who say we represent them. Let's start with them. So there's, of course, several hundreds of those also. There were a thousand of them. And let's ask them that these are the questions we have about where our country should go and what could be done about it. There's 15 questions. Can we give it to your associations or your NGOs to get us the answers to these questions from your members? The very first thing that we got from most of them was, oh, we already know the answers to these questions. I'll tell you what is good for the women of India. Yeah, because I'm running an NGO for the last 30 years and we've got two million members or something. So, you know, I don't need to ask my members. I know it. And the business people, of course, are very sure that they know what all the small-scale industry needs because they've got the biggest industry and so on. So I said, no, no, no. Uh, we just request that since you have a great organization and you say you listen, can you put these specific questions, 15 questions, back to them and three months' time tell us what you have learned in this process? What we found was, I'm saying this, that the women's organization, for example, said, of course we'll do it. And they would have women who had good meetings and so on. But when we come back, you already got here 25 organizations representing women, and they have a lot of competition amongst themselves. So we are each going to give you our views. I said, no, no, that had confused us again. You 25 are then going to talk and listen to each other. And then this woman said to me, said, Mr. Myra, what sort of world do you live in? Do you think <laughs> we could <laughs> listen to each other and give one view to you? I said, that's the problem. So you got to learn also. I mean, she also cares, the other woman leading the other organization, for women's issues, just as you say you care. How is it you can't come to an understanding about what may be the one best way for women amongst the 25 organizations? So when you want to construct a listening into uh, and a large group of people, I think the lateral listening amongst people who think that they are representing the same thing and think that they're like each other, better start there. You might find that you really are not like each other. This in um, thinking like each other. In the United States, there's a lovely book uh, on uh, strangers in our own land, which is now the many coming out. That, I mean, the people are the same. They're Christians, they're white, maybe they have some middle-level uh, incomes. They're in the same families. But there's so much hate of the point of view of the other. So how we become like this is that's been pointing out that even amongst families, the ability to just listen to these deeper things that are bothering us. Well, we're going to talk for another five minutes and we will listen to the audience. We'll have a 15-minute Q&A. There is an International Listening Day. Is that a UN uh, thing or in India? No, no. It isn't. Uh, you know, uh, the, His Holiness the Dalai Lama has been saying that we must teach children how to, how to listen. And I say that listening is such a simple thing. But it can be a solution to so many social ills if you just listen better. Uh, so we have yoga from India, which is about breathing. It's a very simple thing. A baby, the first thing the baby does is start to breathe. It comes out of the womb. And yet, we are having to teach people how to breathe better so that they'll be healthier, their minds will be calmer. So something as simple as breathing can be a solution to very complex problems. Uh, health problems. So I just say, I think something as simple as listening to could be a solution to very complex social problems also. So I've been just teasing out in our government and no one listens, <laughs> saying that, you know, we take great pride in saying yoga is an Indian invention. And the prime ministers, of course, now every national day leading a big yoga uh, exercise with thousands of people. And then the United Nations declared an international yoga day. So I said, why not an International Listening Day? And why wouldn't India start by first having an India Listening Day, school listening days? I think we need to make a movement around listening. Well, just before we open it up to the audience, what's a skill that somebody could use this very afternoon in a conversation to really have an effective listening experience? I'd say so, this is a simple exercise. If you would, uh, by the end of the day, uh, at the end of the day, just say, who are the persons that you met that seemed strange to you? And what in your conversation with these strange people did you find as questions that you'd like to ask them if you didn't get a chance to? And I'm not talking about questions to put them down, 
but questions about why they think and who they are. And if you could at that time also write for yourself what occurred to you about why do I think like this. So at the end of the day, you'll have a little sheet of the success you had during the day and you're starting a learning journey into listening. Well, we uh, will take some questions. I can't quite see, but we have a microphone, I believe. If anyone has a question, you can raise your hand. We'll get a microphone to you. My husband is Indian, and our children have grown up in both cultures. We have made many trips to India, and they have had this experience of becoming quite passionate about uh, social justice issues, disparities of wealth, and so forth. Uh, but we do not live here in Boulder. We live north of here in a very different sort of community. So as my children have gotten active within a school setting, which is quite a safe setting, I think they do feel very heard and encouraged but when they've taken these kind of advocacy issues into our community, unfortunately, they've experienced what you might call the modern day equivalent of hate mail via social media, so Instagram, Snapchat, and so on. Many of these trolls have actually been adults. So as parents or grandparents or any adult who cares about our idealistic young people, how do we encourage them to pursue good works yet also keep them safe? have an answer easily. We'll take a few more. It's okay, another question too, and let me reflect on that a little bit. Thank but you. Like, I mean, I would yeah, just like please. to weigh in, because this is something I think about too a lot as a mother, and when we had Arun read out that introduction to the book about put down your smartphones, I think us as adults, we have to model the behavior, because we tell children to behave in one way, and then we're acting in a completely different way, and I've become a lot more aware of my communication skills because of my kids and I see how they look at me and so if I'm just quick to have a knee-jerk reaction and make a off-the-cuff remark they're internalizing all of that they're learning from us I mean that doesn't of course answer you have a, a very complex situation very upsetting but I've just you know myself as a parent have have just really become a lot more aware of my own ways that I communicate and how often I have a child asking me a question but I'm too busy because I've got my face stuck on the screen so I think we all as adults have to absolutely model the behavior that we want kids to emulate. So, best wishes with everything you're dealing with. Any other questions? Sorry. Oh, I have the mic. Um, so, uh, I guess I'll give an example. So, I get that listening, um, you know, let's just take the current scene with a certain party in power isn't, um, you know, I could listen for, oh, you're of a certain era, afraid to lose your power. I could have empathy for that. Um, and that's as far as I can go in terms of empathizing. Do you see what I mean? Like, I could do, how do I listen past empathizing, oh, here's a whole party in power, afraid to lose their power? Um, I don't know how to. It's so easy to write there, dismiss certain folks in this culture because they don't want to give up. Do you, I, do you under, I don't know how to listen past that. I'm not trying to change their mind. I get that listening doesn't mean I agree with you. I don't know how to be a human being listening past a, a whole different paradigm that has seen its day. Is that a fair question? It's a very... Uh a uh, fair question. I, I, I get asked this uh, now that I'm talking about listening amongst uh, young people in college who uh, passed, just passed college who want to change the world. And they say this, that, uh, you know, there's certain things, Mr. Myra and Arun, I'm not going to accept. And you're asking me to listen and understand the other person, but something in me says, it's wrong, and I'm not going to accept it. Hmm? And so what do you say to that? I said, first thing is, you're hearing yourself. You're hearing that it's wrong, right? And uh, I would ask you, if you can just spend a few minutes or a few days on why you believe it's wrong. I'm not asking you to forgive that person yet or to accept it, but just to explore why you believe it's wrong and so. So I come back to Mahatma Gandhi, okay? Now he was willing to forgive all his enemies, as he said, and it's going back to Jesus Christ, saying, I will forgive them for they know not what they do. And Mahatma Gandhi, like he said, I even forgive the British. I mean, 
Yes. I don't hate them. So, but he never accepted it and he won the battle. So there is a non-violence here and I'm coming down to that. There's a non-violence here. We, our instant reaction is a violent one. There's an anger and especially the young people have to say, you know, just stop the action, bite your tongue. Certainly don't respond to the tweet. In fact, why are you on Twitter at all? Because you get provoked repeatedly. Yeah, just, just listen. So, so this is my one thought. Hmm? But a broader thought, it's a political thought, excuse me. Huh? And it's, in the United States right now, in my country too, there's so many causes that need representation. There's the environmental cause, there's the cause of minorities and migrants, and there's the cause of, continues to be of African Americans and women. And so each of these constituencies thinks that, you know, their cause is the most important cause. And each of them is fighting what is power. You know, they want the power system to change so that they get more included. They're not listening to each other also, which is why I gave that example even amongst the women. I found that the, if I could use the word, the democratic movement is so splintered, it is so splintered, whereas the authority movement is always very united. So the conservative movement is a very united movement, and all the democratic, the people's representations, carings, the underprivileged movements, are not even listening to each other. They are not listening to each other at all. So just listen to the deepest caring that we all have together. It goes back to what is a real uh, evolution or a revolution. It is when systems of power find that they cannot carry on anymore because this upsurge of the rest, the powerless people is so huge now. And this is not happening today. And for the last 25 years, because the power system was very strong everywhere, with business associated with the uh, uh, politics everywhere. That the people who are outside that establishment are feeling powerless. Do we have time for another? Oh, we do, okay. I wanted to uh, get back a little bit. You mentioned Daniel Kahneman, thinking fast and thinking slow, systems one, systems two. Are we, um, how much are we a slave to brain biology? And that we can't overcome it. Uh, moral foundations, in, in that book, they use the, the, describing the same thing, but he calls it the elephant and the driver. Uh, and so you, you, you talked about the neocortex slowing things down, but, but we primarily react with our limbic system first. We dichotomize, we have implicit bias. Uh, it seems to me like we can't sort of get around this until we sort of educate ourselves about that. Yes. <laughs> I've read the same book recently, it's a lovely book, Richard Hyde's books on, and his metaphor of the elephant uh, and the rider. And just to, for the sake of the others, if I might say, um, you know, our, our, our judgments, our reasoning comes out just not out of reason alone, which is what he uses the metaphor of a rider who wants to be in control of the situation. We have inside ourselves a big elephant of emotions and cultures and traditions, and we don't even know where it came from and how it's influencing our thinking. Now the rider wants to control our elephant, but as we know coming from India, uh, the rider better be careful of not trying to push the elephant too far, otherwise the elephant will throw and trample the rider. But yes, you do get the elephant to go where you want the elephant to go, but that relationship between the rider and the elephant and the give and take amongst them is very important to manage. That's, you know, managing your own self as it were. Now the conversations between two people are not conversations amongst riders. So let's be rational. They're actually all these emotions, both sides, the elephants are having to talk with each other. How do you have conversations amongst elephants who talk emotions, who talk culture and traditions? And so that's what we are needing to learn uh, uh, if we could get uh, um, things to uh, improve more harmoniously amongst uh, uh, ourselves. Now, I got so taken up by your reminding me of the elephant and the rider that I almost forgot what the question was. Oh, I have forgotten the question. Well, just, I mean, are we sort of enslaved to that? In other words, I mean that evolutionarily uh, we're, we're sort of trapped by that because the emotions that we had, say, 20,000 years ago had more adaptive value. They don't apply in current cultural context, and the culture shifts much faster than the evolutionary changes. So how do we... That's right. Thank you. That's what I was missing. Yes, yes. So there is this uh, elephant in us which we can't rationally change. I may want myself to like certain things, but I can't rationally convince myself that I will like them. My liking will evolve and change, 
right? Now, what is, we become as human beings, we got technology, and with technology we believe we've got power to change the system. And we seem to forget that we are part of the system. So as we change the system, the system begins to affect us and change us again. So this is where social technology is the point that, yes, we invented this technology, we've changed the environment with that technology, and that environment is now changing our brains even, and changing uh, the levels of empathy that we have for each other. So I must see myself as part of a larger system. I cannot be in control of that system. I shouldn't imagine that I'm some god who is outside the system and can control the system. Whereas we as scientists, particularly technologists, seem to think that I can master this whole system, forgetting that, A, as I said, I am the system also. So what I'm trying to master is me too, an elephant in me which my mind, rational scientific thinking cannot master at all. So it comes to a humility, and this is where, whether it's Buddhism or, or the deepest Hinduism and most religions and the mystical side of religions would say, is just accept that you are a very tiny part of a very large scheme of things. Accept and change. So God, give me the courage to change the things I can, the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, and the wisdom to know the difference. Hello, sir. Um, it's been a pleasure listening to you this morning. Um, I would like to know your thoughts on um, what you think would be the individual responsibilities to encourage, uh, let's say, deeper thinking in immediate social circle and um, like family and friends, and then extending that, extrapolating that to what would be the tools that society and uh, strategies that the social structures can use to cultivate uh, a similar kind of uh, behavior among the people. And um, yeah, I would just like to uh, know your thoughts on that. The first is responsibility. I think all of us must take responsibility for uh, our own selves, my own thinking, my own listening. Uh, and then if we can, like she mentioned about her own family, is to encourage in the family, teachers in school, in school. So start from where you are and start with the thing that you are, only you are supposedly responsible for, that is yourself, and then something else that you've been made responsible for also uh, around yourself. That's it. Don't try and change the world. It's, if many people start to change themselves and changing the little world around them, the world will change. It's not going to be done top down. The tools, I, one I mentioned already, is that, you know, start being aware of the level of your listening. You may think you're listening, you may be just hearing. So I mentioned to you the levels of listening. Just rehearse that for yourself. And if you can, now we come to expanding the learning about listening, if you can start using this structure with others to say, you know, that was good. You seem to have heard the information I gave you, but you haven't asked me any question about why I think like that. And I want to say that, <laughs> because that's what I want to be really heard about. And so, so then you start expanding the use of this simple thing like listening, as I say, infecting much larger processes with this very simple thing. So listening is, it can be infectious. It be learned as a skill and we rehearse it, it becomes the way we do it. And there are certain societies in which listening is better, I find, and certain societies it's less so. And I did feel that when I was amongst people in Sweden and Norway, there seemed to be a greater instinct to, to accept another person's point of view than there seemed to be in some other societies where it's much more about being the loudest and the being the most noticed. Hi, I just uh, wondered what you think about uh, the competitive structure of society and um, how that creates an ego and, uh, and how that ego basically um, puts everybody into like a, um, a stereotype and how, how you can, how we can break that, that bond there and kind of understand who we are beyond the ego. Yeah, you know, I'm getting a little philosophical and uh, political also perhaps, that we've had for the last 40, 50 years a great drive towards individualism. 
that every individual is unique and must be able to be herself or himself and so and that's good. We are forgetting that individuals exist in the larger society. So our respect for the system around ourselves and the nurturing of the system around ourselves, not just nurturing ourselves, is very important too. And in fact, human beings have got ahead of other species because we developed structures of cooperation, deliberately with our minds developed structures of cooperation, which animals still deliberately with their minds don't. They know how to herd, geese know how to fly in gaggles, but they haven't thought through what are better structures of cooperation. We human beings have. What has happened, I fear, in the last 50 years is the drive towards individualism, and very much so in the United States and elsewhere, has gone ahead of the development of, the further development of structures of cooperation, the systems of cooperation amongst, uh, amongst people. So competition and cooperation must go together. If competition and the desire to be this narcissist way which the social media is encouraging to be always noticed gets ahead of my respect for others and the structure, social structures of cooperation, we will have disharmony in society which we are experiencing. Um, so, as a, as a therapist, I work with nonviolent communication quite a bit and teach it. Um, and one of the things that I've come to really understand about nonviolent communication is that it's a very embodied process. And I know that you mentioned the mindfulness of this. And there's two parts to it. It's the listening to other, but it's also deep listening to yourself. And I, I heard you say that. This, so kind of one of the comments that I have, and especially towards the woman who was talking about her children online, to speak from that place, I've really like work with nonviolent communication as being 90% of like deep listening of what's happening for us on an emotional level, underlying needs that can potentially be expressed, which doesn't mean that we're limiting boundaries or anger from being part of that expression. Um, and at the same time, when we can deeply listen to ourselves, there might be that opening that we can then listen to somebody else. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there and wonder what your thoughts are on that process of actually listening to ourselves first can be a really crucial part before listening to Thank you, other. and that may be a good, good way to conclude. Um, I found that if you ask people what do you care about most in life? I will ask you. I notice that, uh, um, and I say, don't give me an instant answer. Just reflect on it for 30 seconds. They generally go into three minutes, because it's a question that they haven't really thought about. And then I have to call them and saying, okay, I mean, I was supposed to be doing some talking, and you guys are taking my time You're reflecting on what you deeply care about. Um, and if I ask them at the after that, would you like to listen to what the person sitting next to you was thinking for the last three minutes and taking notes? And just listen. Don't make a comment. And if you listen to that person, maybe the person might wish to listen to you. So I say, fine. So five minutes pass, then they want to listen to someone else. I said, this meeting is taken off. It was supposed to be me saying something. Now people are busy listening to each other. But the point is, as they say, I said, why has this happened? They say, you know, I asked myself, or you asked me a question which I never ask. And I asked someone else that question, what do you care about? And we started talking about the deep inside. What do we care about most deeply? And we find a fair amount of agreement. And we do find some disagreements. But we're talking from a different place. From a different place. I think it really helps. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Arun. Thank you, everyone, for coming out to listen on this Saturday morning. Arun will be signing copies of his book, Listening for Wellbeing Conversations with People Not Like Us, just outside. So thank you so much. Thank you.